because what I'm about to say is what everybody in this position of introduction has to say, but I want to make sure you know I actually mean it. And I say that it is a genuine honour and real pleasure to ask you to put your hands together for George Moffat. Well, thanks so much, Sarah, and thank you, everybody, for coming. It's a great pleasure to be back in my favorite English city. Um, <laughs> no, 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 seriously, it is. This is Yorkshire. I studied ecology as part of my degree, but it wasn't until I was working in the Amazon that I really began to appreciate what a fantastic subject it was. And while I was there, I fell in with a crowd of ecologists who were right at the frontier of their discipline, almost on a monthly basis, discovering amazing new things. And all the discoveries really led to the same overarching conclusion, that if you wanted to protect wildlife, biodiversity in the Amazon, you had to protect the forests. You had to stop the forests from being transformed into ranches, which was really the, the ultimate end of, of all the attacks upon the forest. They get transformed into ranches, and then people would put cattle on them. And the reason for this was quite clear, that the great majority of wildlife requires cover and natural architecture for its survival. Cover in order to hide from predators, to ambush prey, to escape the extremes of temperature and humidity, structure and architecture in order to have lots of different niches, lots of different places where different species can make their home and, and exploit places which are marginally different from the ones that other animals or, or plants have specialized in making use of. And of course when that cover and, and that um, uh, what the biologists call structural heterogeneity, the, the complexity of the architecture, when that is removed um, then the great majority of species there lose their homes. And what I saw happening all too often was these fantastically complex, astonishing ecosystems being replaced by these highly simplified and degraded ones, which, after a cycle of repeated cutting and burning and grazing, ended up either as rough grassland or as low perennial scrub shrubs dominated by just one or two species. I worked in the tropics, lived and worked there for about six years, and then I came back to Britain. And it took me all of 15 years to grasp the obvious lessons of what I had learnt in the Amazon. In fact, it wasn't until I moved to Mid Wales, where I lived until fairly recently, that I began for the first time ever to see what should have been blindingly obvious, what now seems blindingly obvious to me, but which I, in common with almost all other ecologists and conservationists, had somehow miraculously failed to see. When I moved to this little tiny town um, called, called Machantlet, which is between Snedonia on one side and the Cambrian Mountains on the other, I felt like a battery chicken that had just been released from its cage, blinking in the daylight. I was overwhelmed by choice, by the extraordinary expanses of land that I could walk into in any direction I wished. I could just step out of my back door and walk. And I, you could go for a whole day without even seeing another human being. Two, two friends of mine once walked for six days across the Cambrian mountains and didn't see a single other person. Plenty of sodding sheep, but not a single person there. And no one tells you to get off the land. Um, it doesn't really matter whether you're on a footpath or not, because you can just roam. A lot of it's covered by right to roam anyway. And, and I, I, I was so excited that I scarcely knew how to contain myself, because I, I thought, well, I'm going to do this walk and that walk, and that. just not enough days in my life to do all of this. But gradually, that excitement gave way to puzzlement. And the puzzlement gave way to disappointment, and the disappointment gave way to despair. Because it didn't matter which direction I walked, whether into Snowdonia, whether into the Cambrians, which mountains I climbed, the, the result was the same. 
which was an almost total absence, not just of human life, but also of wildlife. For a start, there were no trees. Wherever you went, there was just nothing but grassland and sometimes a bit of heather. And the reason became clear that these hills had been comprehensively sheep wrecked, utterly shagged by the white plague. And what, what the sheep do is they eat the little seedlings um, of the trees which, which start, start to grow and, and that means that when the older trees die off there's nothing left to replace them, that the trees are basically dying in their boots, that the forests are dying in their boots and you could see where the forest frontier had just been pushed back and pushed back and pushed back, you could see tiny little fragments of woodland which were just on their last legs because there were no trees younger than about a hundred years old and, and the old trees were beginning to fall and die. There were no birds. You could walk all day long and see two crows, perhaps one pipit if you were lucky. You get down on your hands and knees and there were no insects. Even in the middle of summer you could push your way through the heather or the grass or the moss. There was nothing there. It was extraordinary. And, and I, I was flabbergasted by this, not least because everything I'd been told was that this was one of the great wildernesses of Britain. That's one of the reasons why I moved there. That this was this um, a place where nature was allowed to let rip. And I began to recognize very soon that the, the city from which I'd come, with its broken, fragmented ecosystems, was far richer in life than these great empty expanses, which are almost useless for agriculture. You're talking about one sheep per hectare, one sheep per two hectares in some places. Incredibly poor land, infertile land, and yet they were also uh, almost entirely bereft of wildlife simply because everything had been grazed away. So I did what seemed obvious. I, I thought, I've got to find oases in these, desert, in, 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 in these great deserts. And so I, I looked up the wildlife sites run by the local wildlife trust, the Montgomeryshire Wildlife Trust, and straight away I saw online uh, what they call the jewel in the crown of their reserve system, the Glasslyn Reserve, which they described as really wild. And they said, here, nature is allowed to do its own thing, and these, we've got these amazing species and all this incredible land um, right in the heart of the Cambrian Mountains. Um, and, and, and they described it as their flagship reserve. So I thought, right, that's, that's the place for me. I got there. I almost walked straight through out the other side, looking for where the reserve was. Because what I saw when I got there was almost identical to what surrounded it. It was just low grass and low heather and absolutely swarming with bloody sheep. And I thought, well, something, something's gone horribly wrong here. Someone's left the gate open. The, the sheep have got in. So I phoned the Montgomeryshire Wildlife Trust and said, something's gone horribly wrong with your reserve. It, it's covered in sheep. And they said, oh, no, they're meant to be there. I said, what? what, what, what what's a Mesopotamian ruminant doing in your reserve? Why is it meant to be there? And they said, well, they're, they're helping us to manage the reserve to keep the interest features in favorable condition." I said, that's favorable condition. And they said, yeah, no, it's all in the management plan. You know, these, these are the interest features. We've got to maintain the coarse grasses and, and, and the heather moorland. And I said, well, I'd, I'd love to see this management plan. Said, well, you have to join the organization. So I joined the trust. I got a copy of the management plan. And it's true. Everything I had seen was specified. It said, the grass in this part of the reserve must be no more than 10 centimetres high. The heather in this part of the reserve must be no more than 30 centimetres high. We maintain it through a regime of cutting, burning and grazing. Oh, and um, uh, by the way, uh, one of our biggest problems is invasive, undesirable species, which we spend a lot of um, uh, time and money every year removing. So I phoned them up again and said, what are these invasive, undesirable species you're talking about? And they said, oh, um, that's trees. <laughs> and I said, what, you mean like these sort of exotic Sitka spruce trees blowing in from the plantations, that sort of thing? And I said, no, 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 it's all these hawthorns and birches and rowans, you know, they keep springing up and we had to send people in with chainsaws and cut them down, grub them out, you know, because otherwise, you know, the whole place would revert to trees. <laughs> and, and so I said, well, well why? why? Why are you doing it this way? Why, you know, why, 
Why is the heather moorland and, and, and the grassland, why is that the, the, the special interest features? Ah, because those support our key indicator species. Animals like the um, skylark and the moorland flea beetle and the ring oozel and the wheat ear, which happen to be among the very few which can survive without deep cover. So I said, well, why are those the key indicator species? Ah, they said, because those show that the, the habitats in the reserve are in favorable condition. So I said, oh, wait a minute. So, so the key indicator species are those that show they're in favorable condition. Favorable condition is that it supports the key indicator species. Have we just, uh... oh yes, look, we're right back where we were at the beginning. So, so I, I, I said, oh, I'm just not getting this. There's something I'm missing. I just don't understand why this is considered to be the desirable state of, 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 of this reserve. And they said, well, you know, it's not really up to us. It's the Countryside Council for Wales, the statutory body. They set the standards. They say what the favoured habitat should be, the interest features of this site of special scientific interest. They say what favourable condition of those is. And if we don't do it, we're, we're in legal trouble. We, 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 we're breaching um, the, the rules on maintaining a site of special scientific interest. So you have to go and talk to them. So I go to the Countryside Council for Wales and, um, and I said, why are you telling Montgomery Wildlife Trust to trash this, this nature reserve, this site of special scientific interest through a regime of cutting, burning and grazing? And, and they said, oh, well, we kind of see your point. But it's not up to us, Gov, it's the JNCC, the Joint Nature Conservation Committee in Peterborough, who are the overarching statutory body for the whole of the UK, so you had to go and see them. So I went to the JNCC and I said, why are you telling CCW to tell MWT to trash its SSSI? Uh, you, 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 you're following me, I take it. And, um, and they said, oh, it's not up to us, Gov, it's, it's the European Commission, the Habitats Directive. They, they, they lay down what should be the interest features and what favourable condition is. So I go to them and say, why are you telling JNCC to tell CTW to tell MWT to trash its SSSI? And they said, oh, it's not up to us, Gov, it's the statutory agencies within the nations themselves who tell us what they think the, the, the special interest features should be. So again, I've just gone right round in a circle. And then, and only then, it suddenly hit me. The thing which had been staring me in the face all my life because I've been mad keen about ecology all my life and was not seeing it. That while in places like Brazil, we are trying to protect the rainforests against the ranches, in Britain, we're defending the ranches against the rainforests. And we call it conservation. And we do so through a regime of cutting, burning, and grazing, which when we see it in the Amazon, we call an ecological disaster. We send millions of pounds to, to, to Brazilian environment groups to try to get them to stop it from happening. We, 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 we get really angry and upset when we see the rainforest being destroyed and replaced by what looks just like Heather Moorland, and, 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 and the rough grassland which we get in this country. It's the same kind of habitat, which is the result, the inevitable result, of a repeated regime of cutting, burning, and grazing. And yet over here, we call it looking after nature. It's absolutely bonkers. And it became very clear to me, because I then spent months pursuing this question with loads of people, as I recognized that all over the uplands of Britain, the same thing prevails, that we have these completely deforested landscapes, you'll be familiar with them around here, and that even the conservation areas are also completely deforested and kept in that state by the management plans of the conservation bodies. It became very clear to me that no one was asking the obvious question, why are we doing this? And, 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 that, and it, they'd simply got locked in to preserving what we happen to have, the very degraded and impoverished um, set of species that we happen to have, without even questioning whether that is the desirable state of the ecosystem. And what they seem to have succumbed to is what the fisheries biologist Daniel Pauly called shifting baseline syndrome. And that is that uh, every generation conceives as natural and normal 
the state of nature in their own youth. So you look back to your, your, your own youth, well, some of you don't have to. Uh, people like me look, look, look to the dim and distant past and say, that's what we need to get back to. That, that, that was when nature was, was rich and varied, and we need to get back to how it was when I was young. Forgetting that that state was itself extremely degraded and impoverished. And, and with every generation that passes, as, as you have fewer and fewer species and, and less and less ecological function, you forget. It's a great forgetting. Shifting baseline syndrome is a great forgetting, which is why we object so little to the continued degradation of the natural world, because with every generation we forget what went before. And, and, and so extreme is shifting baseline syndrome that it affects even professional ecologists who have come to see the sheep wreck wastelands of the uplands, which is the place where you would expect nature to be rich and varied and self-willed, um, they've come to see that as the desirable norm. And that state is what accounts for the fact that while um, the European Union as a whole has an average of 37% forest cover in Britain, ours is 12%. The reason is, you can see it when you go to Europe, that there, the lowlands are largely bare, which is what you would expect, because that's where the fertile agricultural land is. And the uplands are largely forested, which is what you would expect, because that's where the infertile land, which is almost completely useless for food production is. Here, the lowlands are largely bare, the uplands are even barer. Maintained in that state, either by grouse shooters, or deer stalkers, or, or by sheep farmers. All of them extremely damaging activities. Now, you know, sheep, it's almost heretical to say that in Britain, that, that sheep farming has caused more damage to, to, to the ecology of this nation than all the building and industry that has ever taken place here. But it seems to me to be true. It's heretical because sheep have, have occupy an almost sacred position in our culture and that of other cultures. It's a, the pastoral literary tradition goes back to Theocritus in the third millennium BC where he conceived of shepherding as, as, as the seat of innocence and purity by contrast to the corruption of the city. And this theme is then picked up by Virgil and Ovid. And then in Britain, much later on, when there is this great classical revival by Marlowe and Spencer and Shakespeare and As You Like It, and it continues today, every Sunday night in Country File. In fact, if the BBC were any keener on sheep, it would be illegal. And, 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 and we, we, you know, the sheep is Agnes Day, the Lamb of God. Uh, uh, we, we, we see them as, as being almost the essence of what our nation is about. They weren't always seen that way. I mean, Thomas More, he's had a bad rap recently, but in, in Utopia, he, he, he talked of the sheep which were wont to be so mild and such small eaters suddenly becoming man-eating creatures because they were used as the instrument of dispossession as the, as the, as the landlords cleared the land um, and replaced the very complex agricultural systems which, 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 which people were running with these great big sheep ranches which required hardly any labour. And he talked about how the sheep is demolishing entire communities across Britain. That process continues today. And these sheep farmers who are extolled by country file and they're multi-millionaires, these people. There's been a massive consolidation of land ownership. And these are the new aristocrats. They've got hundreds, sometimes thousands of hectares of land. Um, the, the land price has risen four times as fast as the price of housing in this country has risen, ag agricultural land, because it's a great speculative asset. The city boys, having destroyed the assets which, um, which they themselves traded in, destroyed the value of equities, started investing in land instead. And so anyone who's got a large land holding is exceedingly rich nowadays. But we have this long-standing tradition of deference in Britain towards the lords of the land, towards the large landowners. And that's now switched because you know, you, you, it, it's, it's no longer fashionable, fashionable to be deferential directly towards the dukes and the, the lords, but it's switched to these new very big landowners <coughs> who pose as peasants, effectively, but are aristocrats. We are seeing in England now the fastest rate of consolidation of land tenure there has been since the enclosures and the highland clearances, 2% a year. 
And it's something that the British government is trying, the Westminster government is trying to accelerate. It's an extraordinary situation. And these sheep, so they continue to cause social havoc, but also continue to cause ecological havoc, and havoc to lives which seem far removed from where the sheep are. It, uh, um, by keeping the hills treeless, it ensures that they don't hold back the water anymore. And instead of a steady release of water, which you get from forested hills, where the, most of the rain falls, you get a cycle of flood and drought. And the, the severe floods which Britain suffered um, the winter before last were undoubtedly exacerbated by the destruction of the watersheds. We see a massive loss of soil, a massive loss of soil carbon, and of course this huge, huge loss of wildlife all taking place at the same time. And the amazing thing is that conservation, because it has lost its way, it's lost perspective, collaborates in this great schema of destruction. So we, we, we end up in a situation where um, we have effectively lost almost all the trophic levels in the chain of life. Now, trophic means pertaining to feeding, eating, and being eaten. Um, and the, the, the top levels in this country, the large carnivores, the large herbivores, the medium-sized carnivores, um, a lot of the medium-sized herbivores, those have almost all gone. I mean, let's, let's look, at, look at the sort of the, 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 ultra, the definitive baseline for British wildlife, just to get some perspective on how much we've lost. And that, the, the best baseline probably is the Eemian period, the previous interglacial period, which ended 113,000 years ago. And it's a good baseline because the temperature was almost identical to ours, the climate was very similar, um, and there were no people here at that time. It was a very short interglacial, and it seems that people didn't arrive during it. And at the time, you had all the familiar British wildlife. You had robins, foxes, hedgehogs, badgers, magpies, elephants, rhinos, lions, hyenas, scimitar cats, hippopotamus. Oh, yes, we had a megafauna. Everywhere on Earth had a megafauna. The megafauna is the default state of all ecosystems. And the only reason why we see megafaunas as being exotic and, and remarkable things which occur in a few pockets in the tropics is that they've been wiped out everywhere else. There were lions hunting reindeer across the frozen tundra throughout the Ice Age in this country. They didn't become extinct here till 11,000 years ago, a blink of an eye. In, in ecological terms. You know, we think of a lion as a tropical animal. A lion is a universal species. They lived everywhere. Um, they, they, there are lions living and breeding, have been doing so since the 1950s, in outdoor enclosures in the Vossaburst Zoo in Siberia. Temperature gets to minus 50 in the winter. They're perfectly happy. They, they, they are not a, a strictly tropical species. They can live almost anywhere, and they did. Why do trees in this country, coppice and pollard, in other words, why do even mature trees, why are they able to re-sprout from wherever the trunk is broken? Why is it possible to lay a hedge? Think of what you do when you're laying a hedge. You, you, know, you probably haven't done it, but, but, um, but, but what they do is they, they almost sever the living wood. They twist it, they split it, they trample it down, and yet whew, the trees come back just as vigorously as before the following spring. What an amazing adaptation. Why would they have evolved to do that? Well, the wind isn't going to do that to them. The deer or cattle aren't going to do that to them. Um, why, why, why do birch trees have black and white bark? What, why do understory trees like box and holly and yew, even though they, they carry a lot less weight than the big canopy trees like oak and beech and ash, um, and, and they're subject to much lower shear forces from the wind. Why are they so much tougher and harder to break and harder to topple than those big canopy trees? It seems like a mystery. But all these um, phenomena, I believe, have a single explanation. Elephants. Because during um, the last interglacial period and for much longer in the rest of Europe, up until about 30,000 years ago, our ecosystems were dominated by Elephas anticus, the straight-tusked elephant. It made the, in, uh, the African elephant look like a ballet dancer. This thing was a monster, a huge tree-toppling beast. And any tree which could not resist its tender affections would simply be wiped out. 
And so the understory trees had to be super tough because the elephants could reach the crowns and they would just pull them over if they didn't have incredibly tough roots and branches. Birch trees with their black and white bark possibly had the same function as the zebra's hide has. That the, when you've got an animal with very limited color vision, as the elephant has, um, lost amongst the birch wood, it's going to struggle more to select a tree to pull over than, than if, the, if, if the trees are within its color range. That's a possibility, but it's a bit speculative. But the coppicing and the hedging, well, there are hundreds of papers if you go to a, to a holding library, you'll find hundreds of papers on the co-evolution of elephants and trees in Africa, and they talk, they use those very terms, coppicing and hedging. And yet, you, know, you look at our trees, which have exactly the same adaptations as the mopane or the knobthorn acacia or the trees they talk about in those papers, and yet there's not a word about how they acquired those adaptations because of shifting baseline syndrome, because even the professional ecologists have forgotten. So when you step out of here this evening and when you walk through the park or down a leafy street or anywhere that's got trees, you are walking through the shadows of these great beasts. You are walking through a ghost ecosystem, the remnants of a remarkable world of megafauna. Paleoecology, the study of past ecosystems, is like a portal through which we may pass to an enchanted kingdom. And what we also learn, as we begin to understand what was here and how it worked, is that ecosystems function in completely different ways to the way we, 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 we've come to believe they function because we've been studying artifacts of destruction. We've been studying very degraded ecosystems which no longer have their original functions. And one of the most exciting findings, I believe, in any field of science in, in recent times has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. You remember trophic is to do with feeding, a cascade, you know what that is. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which tumbles from the top of the food web down to the bottom. Now, when I studied ecology back in the Dark Ages, we were taught that ecosystems were basically controlled from the bottom up that you have a particular climate, a particular soil, which then determines the type of vegetation you get, which then determines the population of herbivores, which then determine the population of carnivores. But we believe that to be the case because we were studying ecosystems which had lost most of their large carnivores and large herbivores. But when you study ecosystems which haven't, or where those species have been reintroduced, you find again and again that it works the other way around. A classic example is what happened when wolves were reintroduced to the Yellowstone National Park in 1995 after an absence of 70 years. And during that period, much of the park had become well, rather like the Scottish Highlands look today. Masses of deer which had overgrazed the land, there were hardly any trees growing. When the wolves came in, almost instantly things began to change. And there were small numbers of wolves in an area much bigger than Norfolk, a very large area of land. Um, it wasn't so much the amount of deer they ate as what ecologists call the landscape of fear they created. There were all sorts of places where the deer would no longer go because they could easily be trapped or ambushed in those places. And in those spots, you saw this amazing ecological restoration take place. In, in the river valleys, the, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. And these tiny little shrubs grazed down and grazed down. They then boomed back into forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. The, the numbers of migratory songbirds increased massively for the same reason, because they could occupy the trees. So did the number of beavers. And the beavers then in turn, with their dams, create a whole series of habitats which other species can occupy, the otters and the muskrats and reptiles, amphibians, fish, invertebrates, ducks, um, because they, like the wolves, are ecosystem engineers or keystone species, species whose ecological impacts are out of proportion to their numbers alone. And, and, and they created a whole set of habitats which were then occupied by other species. Bear numbers increased because they started eating the berries on the returning shrubs and the carrion the wolves had left behind. 
so do the numbers of, of bald eagles and ravens and other scavengers too. There was this transformative effect on the entire ecosystem. But it didn't stop there. The rivers began, began to meander less. They formed more pools and riffle sections. Their shape changed. And it was because the returning trees stabilized their banks. There was less soil erosion on the hillsides because of the vegetation coming back. The wolves changed not, over the, not only the entire ecology, but also the physical geography of the site. They actually changed the nature of the soil. And all the fairy tales we've ever been told, which tell us that the sheep are the heroes and the wolves are the, are the villains, they're completely the wrong way around. <laughs> Another example is, is what's happened recently in Ireland, um, where, uh, amazingly, by contrast to, to, to here in Britain, the grey squirrel population is, has been in massive and long-term decline over the past 20 years. Now, it's a sort of article of faith among ecologists that once grey squirrels have turned up in a country which they're not native to, they're North American, there's no stopping them. You know, people in this country spend millions on trapping and shooting and poisoning them. And even if you clear all the squirrels for several square miles, within 10 weeks, the population's back up to what it was before. They're very fast breeding, they're very mobile, um, and they have major ecological impacts because they prevent young trees from growing. The male squirrels have this weird thing in the breeding season where they strip all the bark, they ring bark young trees. Nobody knows why they do it, but it's a very strange thing. And they eat a lot of species which can't resist them because they didn't co-evolve with them. So there's a lot of problems. They drive out the red squirrels as well. But in Ireland, it's all gone into reverse. It's the most extraordinary thing that the, 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 there's been this shift um, of the grey squirrel population 100 kilometers east. The, the, the land for about 100 kilometers have emptied of grey squirrels and been refilled with red squirrels. Carries on like this for another 20 years, there'll be no more grey squirrels left, left in Ireland. The, 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 the red coats are pushing the grey coats into the sea. Kind of the wrong way around when you consider American history, but, but it's, it's, it, it's this incredible ecological transformation. Well, how has it happened? Not through direct human intervention. What appears to have been the case is that it's a result of the, the, the much less persecution of pine martins. Pine martins, someone described them as otters in dinner jackets. They, they're, 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 they're a member of the otter and the badger and the, and the weasel family, um, and, but they can climb trees and they're, um, and, and, and they're small and agile and light. Um, and they see gray squirrels as meals on legs because grey squirrels did not evolve with pine martins, and they've got no defences against them. The red squirrel's got a very simple defence. It's small and light enough to get to the very end of the twigs where the pine martins can't follow. But by comparison, the grey squirrel is a great lump, and, and, it, and it's much more terrestrial than the red squirrel, and it's just dead meat. And again, what seems to have happened is that the pine martins have created an ecology of fear. And it's not just that they're eating a lot of grey squirrels, but the grey squirrels are so terrified of them that they literally spend the whole summer looking over their shoulders in case there's one coming, rather than putting on weight, and then they die of starvation in the winter. And they're just being wiped out at this phenomenal rate by that landscape of fear which the pine martins have created. And everywhere we look, we see that the role of large animals and predators in particular, but also certain omnivores and herbivores, is absolutely critical to maintaining ecological function. We, everywhere you look, you see that we're basically inhabitants of a ghost ecosystem. So, so for example, why does blackthorn, um, the, the slow bush, put out such enormous spines when it comes under attack? If you flail it or hedge it or something, it puts out these spines two or three inches long. Really nasty. If, if they get into your skin, They'll, they'll superate, get, get, get very unpleasant indeed. They're wildly over-engineered to resist browsing by deer or by cattle, but not perhaps to resist browsing by rhinoceros. And yes, we had two species of temperate forest rhinos in this country, the Merck's rhino and, and, and the narrow-nosed rhinoceros as well. Why are there so many species of marginal plants, plants which grow in marshy areas or around the, the, the edge of water bodies, possibly because they evolved to exploit hippo wallows. 
And the hippos we had here, Hippopotamus amphibius, again living in the same climate as ours, are the same species which live in Africa today. And, and even smaller species have these massive impacts. Um, boar create, wild boar create a whole series of, of micro habitats for loads and loads of species as they root around and they wallow um, and they do all sorts of slightly messy things. Um, mess is hated by humans, but it's just great for nature. Um, if you go to the continent, you'll see an extraordinary thing, that the robins there are not tame. That they don't, they don't follow people around. They don't come close in the same way that they do here. And the reason for that is they don't need to. The robin it is a boar-adapted species. It is to the wild boar what the oxpecker is to the Cape buffalo. And, um, and, and so they follow the boar around, and as the boar start rooting and snuffling in the ground, and they, they turn over the soil, the robins then come down and eat the invertebrates. Well, here there are no boar, so they use us as a substitute, and they follow gardeners around instead. That's what you are, fake pigs. <laughs> uh, and, and, um, and, and what we, we see is that a whole series of ecological functions have simply been terminated in this country, partly because we've lost the forests and partly because we've lost a lot of the species which inhabited those forests. And we live in this empty shell of an ecosystem. And until very recently, and still to this day in many places, the very bodies you would expect to be working to do something about that are maintaining that empty shell not because they're bad people in any way at all, they're, they're very well motivated, but because they've simply lost perspective. And what I and others are now trying to do is to bring some of that perspective back and to do it through a process that we call rewilding. Rewilding is a mass restoration of ecosystems using keystone species and species which are ecological engineers to try to bring back not only the diversity of life, but also the ecological function and dynamism, which is an absolutely essential, integral part of nature. It means bringing back these missing species. It means, wherever possible, taking down the fences, blocking up the drainage channels, getting the trees going again, and then standing back, doing as little as possible once you've got those ecological engineers in place. And a group of us have now, um, in the process of forming something called Rewilding Britain. Um, hopefully within a few weeks it'll be officially launched. We've already got a holding page, so you can sign up to get news feeds from that already. It's rewildingbritain.org.uk. And our aim is to try to facilitate rewilding programs and to bring back some of the species which ought to be there. We've seen a few great reintroductions already, like the white-tailed eagle, the great sea eagles, which were reintroduced on the west coast of Scotland, the ospreys, which have come back by themselves, but with help because they've been protected by people, cranes in the Somerset levels, um, and, um, uh, and bustards on Salisbury Plain. But we want to get even more ambitious than that. And we're now looking at bringing back beavers um, in many parts of the country. We've already seen them come back in Devon, um, when they were um, accidentally released by someone or spontaneously generated there. Um, there's an official trial in, in, in Scotland. Um, uh, wild boar seem also to be able to magic themselves out of nowhere in several parts of the country, but we want to make that official and we want to do it legally and see wild boar come back in many parts. Lynx we would like to bring back, hopefully, within about 10 years. And ultimately, um, within 30 or 40 years, we want to hear the howl of wolves, at least in the Scottish Highlands. And we believe that all this now is, is easily within the realm of feasibility. There are no ecological limits preventing us from doing this. There are political limits. But those political limits are more negotiable than you might at first assume. And what we find now, um, in one opinion poll after another, is that people are really ready for this. And it's happening. It's happened already across vast areas of the rest of Europe, where we've seen the return of wolves, of bears, of bison, of moose, uh, of, of, of lynx, of wolverines, of many other species, which were almost driven to extinction. Beavers are everywhere, boar are everywhere, and it's just a 
commonplace fact of life in Europe. But in Britain, because we're an island, because these species can't come over naturally, um, uh, we, we, we remain um, uh, left out by this remarkable ecological restoration that's taking place. And also because we have these very peculiar land uses, not least the grouse moors and the deer stalking, which keeps land bare where that land would otherwise be covered in forest. And this obsession with sheep farming, which is maintained entirely through public money. There would be no sheep farming at all anywhere in the hills were it not for farm subsidies. Now, I'm not saying I want to get rid of all sheep farming, but I do want to see some areas relieved from it. You know, we've got a monoculture at the moment of these, these empty, bare hills. And, and should we not have at least some large areas where you can step into a self-willed ecosystem? And to me, this is one of the great attractions of rewilding. And not only does it look to the future while conservation tries to lock in the past, not only does it see this progressive ecological change, restoring the dynamism and the function of ecosystems, but it also looks to something better and richer and rawer than we have today, something which is better for us, in other words, as well as for the ecosystem. It's not trying to recreate any former state of nature. You, you can't. You know, every, every era is different. Our, Climate is changing, our soils have been, been eroded, a lot of them have been almost lost altogether. What you're going to get now is going to be different to anything that's come before, but it will still be a functional and dynamic ecosystem rather than one which is being preserved by conservation groups at the moment like a jar of pickles. Nothing allowed in, nothing allowed out. You've got these rigid management plans where everything must be managed down to the last percentage point, which just, that's not nature you're preserving. It might be a cultural artifact, you can call it a cultural reserve, this is a, a former farming system that we're preserving. It's not an ecosystem, not a functioning ecosystem at any rate. But, but what we're doing through this is we're offering some people something in return for the freedoms that us environmentalists are, are saying that people should, should no longer exercise. And you know, look at how we operate. And you know, I'm, I'm very much of, of this mindset. We've been asking people for a long time not to discharge certain freedoms. You know, to 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 fly very little, um, not to, to to drive less, to not to consume a whole lot of things which we shouldn't be consuming. And it's been negatively cast. Now, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. We still have to fight against the bad stuff, and there's an awful lot of bad stuff to fight against. But if you only fight against the bad stuff, well, two things happen. First, you turn people off, and second, you burn out. And you can burn out pretty quickly, unless you've got hope. And what rewilding offers is one aspect of a positive environmentalism. There's lots of other aspects. Transition towns is a very good example of people saying that there's a better way. We could actually create a better world than the one we have today. But rewilding I see as, as an essential part of that process. And what the, the standard environmental message has been is do as we say and the world will be slightly less crap than it would otherwise have been, which isn't exactly an inspiring slogan. But do as we say and the world could be a much more exciting place than what we got to do, uh, what, 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 what we got today. Well, that can inspire people. And look, we do want you to not to exercise these freedoms, but here's a whole lot of other freedoms which you will be able to exercise: a freedom to step into a landscape which isn't controlled and managed and ordered and gridded like all the rest of our lives freedom to lose ourselves, to let our, leave everything behind, which you just don't have at the moment, where you're just constantly bumping into signs of human intervention almost everywhere you go in this country. And I find that, for one, I find that incredibly depressing. I just feel this urge to escape. I feel myself scratching at the walls of life, looking for a, a way into a wider space beyond, um, and, and hemmed in by this oppressive, evidence everywhere you go of intensive human activity. I mean, it is everywhere. You know, you look at our national parks, you don't have to look far to look at our national parks here. Not a single one is above grade five in the international rankings of, of conservation. Grade five 
is so a notch up from a multi-story car park in terms of ecological function, but not but but not much more than that. I mean, it's it, we we don't have anywhere. There is nowhere where you can escape from these these intensive impacts of any scale at all. And the same applies to the sea. I mean, I talked about megafaunas earlier on. The megafaunas were also at sea. Oliver Goldsmith in 1776 described the arrival of the herring as seen from the English shore. He said the main body of the fish um, are, are divided into columns, each four or five miles long and two or three miles wide. And the, the water rolls up before them. In other words, they create a bow wave as they come in. And you could see all this because then the North Sea was clear, largely because it had other ecological functions. The, it was almost a continuous sheet of oysters along the sea, uh, uh, across the sea floor, which both stabilized the sediments and filtered out any murk from the water. So, you know, there's plenty of evidence that the North Sea was almost crystal clear. So you could see all this. You see the herring coming in. And he said behind the herring came the great shoals of cod, which came in to eat the herring. And behind them, the taupe and the spur dog and the other smaller sharks. Behind them, the large shark. The, the blues, the threshers, the makos, and we now believe the great whites as well. With them came the tuna, the long fin tuna, the yellow fin tuna, and the blue fin tuna. Great shoals of blue fin tuna coming in and hitting the herring. The dolphins, the porpoises, but behind them, the pods of sperm whales and fin whales, feeding on the herring within sight of the English shore. We had humpbacks migrating up the Irish Sea. We had grey whales in most of our estuaries and shallow bays. We had a marine megafauna as well as a terrestrial megafauna. And again, it's not difficult to bring that back. If the political will is there, you just create large enough areas where commercial fishing doesn't go and the ecosystem bounces back with remarkable speed. And one of my dreams, rewilding Britain, one of our aims, is to create an entire biome from the mountaintop to the territorial limit of rewilded land and sea. So this complete ecological functional landscape and seascape where the, 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 the great changes which are taking place on land interact with the changes taking place at sea. And you can see the restoration of the oyster beds, of the, the massive lobsters and the crabs, the great shoals of cod, the great shoals of herring and the rest of it, and that then starts bringing the whales back in. And already where there's been a slight easing of the pressure on the, on, on the pelagic fish like herring and, and, and mackerel, which, which, which were up in the water rather than down in the bottom, we've seen um, recently a pod of fin whales turn up 50 miles off Pembrokeshire and stay there for a whole summer in 2012. Fin whales, the second biggest whales on earth, um, there in the Celtic deep. Um, we've seen orcas now off Pembrokeshire for, for, for several years in a row. Um, bluefin tuna have occasionally been turning up again in the North Sea. Uh, you know, these things can happen with tremendous speed, and that's just a very slight easing of the pressure. Imagine what can happen if, if there's a mass rewilding of marine areas. Why shouldn't we all have places where we can snorkel or scuba dive or wander into in the expectation of seeing astonishing wildlife? Why should we have to travel halfway around the world to see it as we do today? And in the con on the continent of Europe where huge amounts of land are now being vacated by farmers, some people suggest 30 million hectares by 2030, that's an area the size of Poland, why shouldn't we have a Serengeti or two? Why not bring back the megafauna? We still have some of the species that we've lost from Europe. They're still alive on Earth. The, the lions and the hyenas and the hippos are all the same species that we had here in Britain and the rest of Europe. The Indian elephant, the Asian elephant, might make a good substitute for the straight tusked elephant. It's its closest living relative and it um, could survive very happily in the climate of Europe, possibly the black rhinoceros would be a good substitute for the two browsing rhinos that we've lost. They would give them a refuge from the massive uh, uh, pressure that they're facing elsewhere in their range, wherever, wherever they live, but also start restoring some of those really massive ecological impacts, very positive habitats and niche creating effects, which, which only the megafauna can give you. And, and isn't that a vision with which to inspire people? 
Because for me, this is what rewilding reintroduces above anything else, something even rarer than the species I've been talking about, and that's hope. And when you're trying to encourage people to love and to fight for the natural world, an ounce of hope is worth a ton of despair. And the promise that rewilding holds out is that we can replace our silent spring with a raucous summer. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, well, we've got plenty of time for questions. And what I'm going to do is go woman, man, woman, man. Otherwise, we know what happens. Um, and so is there a woman who wants to start us off? Yes, there. Um, you'll have to, uh, have we got a roving mic? Oh, yeah, we have, yeah, great. Yeah, go on then. Um, if you bring back the wolves, people are going to get eaten. Thank you. Yes, the, the, the obvious objection, which I hadn't thought of. Um, well, <laughs> look, there's, I mean, there's no doubt that at times wolves have eaten people. Um, if you look at the North America, there are 60,000 wolves, and in the past 200 years, 14 people um, are believed to have been eaten by wolves there. And that's 14 too many, of course it is. Um, and there are ways of, of preventing it from happening at all, not least keeping the wolves sufficiently afraid. And, you know, there's, there's ways of doing that and ways of monitoring them so that you don't have hungry wolves wandering about um, in places where people are going to be vulnerable. So, uh, so, of course, we want to stop that from happening. We don't want anyone killed by wolves. But, you know, let's... let's Put this in perspective, 14 people killed over 200 years. In the US, every year, two people are killed by vending machines. They, 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 they shake them to get the money out with predictable results. So a vending machine could be about to spring on you at any time. Uh, 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 170 people a year in the US are killed by toothpicks. Uh, thousands die from bedroom slippers. Deck chairs are a lethal threat. Um, and, and as for cows and dogs, you know, they're far, far more dangerous. We, we have, we're sort of programmed, I think, in a way, to be uh, frightened of large wild animals, uh, because, of course, it resonates with our deep evolutionary past, because just as we live in a ghost ecosystem, we also inhabit a ghost psyche. We, we evolved um, in a world of, of horns and tusks and fangs and claws, and it was a very thrilling and terrifying and terrible world, wonderful world in many ways, and a terrible world in many ways. I, you know, you look at what we grew up with in Africa. You know, it wasn't just the lions and the leopards and the hyenas. There, 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 there were saber-toothed cats. There were false saber-tooths, which appeared to have been specialist hominin predators. They, they actually specialized in eating us. Um, there, was, there were amphicyanids, bear dogs. Who, who's seen the, the first Hunger Games film? Many of you seen that? You know those creatures they sort of magicked up and sent into the forest? They are almost identical to these amphicyanids, and, and it seems that they were quite deliberately recreating them um, uh, because they were tapping into an ancestral fear. They were very frightening, those creatures, weren't they? And these things had this huge bite radius, and they did look like halfway between a bear and a dog, which those things did. Um, terrifying creatures. There was an otter the size of a lion with enormous fangs. I mean, there's this amazing range of species because, you know, this was part of our great lost global megafauna. And everywhere we went, it was the same thing. I mean, in North America, there was an eight-foot beaver. Eight foot from nose to tail. It weighed the same as a black bear. There, there was um, a bird in Argentina, the Argentine rock, Ar Argentavis magnificens, with a 26-foot wingspan. There were, there were, there were nine-foot saber-toothed salmon migrating up the, <laughs> migrating up the Pacific rivers. Um, there was, um, there were packs of giant saber-tooths going around, um, uh, and giant lions in, in, in North America. But it seems they were no match for the, for, for the short-faced bear, which stood 13 feet on its hind legs and appears to have been a specialist scavenger specializing in driving giant saber-tooths and giant lions off their kills. You know, this was this extraordinary world in which we grew up. I mean, when people first arrived in Australia, there was a monitor lizard seven and a half meters long, 50% bigger than a Nile crocodile. It was like a Komodo dragon, but from here to there. You know, it, it was a dinosaur, basically. It was like a dinosaur. Um, there, was, um, there was a marsupial lion with the strongest bite of any known 
species, any known mammal species, um, which could stand on its hind legs and slash with its enormous claws. It seems to have been a specialist predator of giant kangaroos, which grew to 10, 10 feet high. There, there was a wombat the size of a rhinoceros. You know, it's like everywhere on Earth was this extraordinary, remarkable, mind-blowing megafauna. And we're, we're tuned to that. We're tuned to be very afraid of that because we had to be very afraid of it. And we had to be hyper aware of our environment to see that tail twitching in the grass, which, which was the difference between life and death was seeing that. And well, what have we got to latch on to now? I mean, a pretty, pretty poor selection of frightening creatures, but we channel a lot of those fears onto them. But why the wolf? You know, the wolf actually isn't that frightening by comparison to a lot of other animals. You know, hippos are far more dangerous than wolves. You know, there's, there's, um, there, there, there are a lot of animals which, which are much more likely to do you in than wolves. Far more people are killed by hitting deer in their cars than, than they'll ever be eaten by wolves. And in fact, by killing deer, and uh, the wolves can both reduce that and reduce the incidence of Lyme disease, so it's possible that they can actually reduce total mortality anyway. Um, but, but why wolves? And I think the reason is, the reason we're so afraid of wolves is because we're so much like them. They have the same social intelligence as we do, which is why we domesticated them. They look at you like they can read your thoughts. In fact, they can read your thoughts, which is why we domesticated them. And that gaze that the wolf has, that sort of knowing gaze that's saying, I am you, I am the same thing as you are, basically, but I've got something different that you haven't got despite that. That, that is what really unnerves us, what we find uncanny. And I think that my, my hypothesis is that that's why there are so many of these astonishing fairy tales about how evil the wolf is, but also so many stories about us merging with wolves and, and, and wolves becoming people and people becoming wolves because we are such remarkably similar creatures. Sorry, long answer to a very short question. <laughs> right, man with a question. I'll go to the back first and then I'll, I'll go right over there just to... Um, I, um... I'm interested, especially when you talk about easing the pressures on the oceans. And I think it's a, I totally agree with you, but my, my concern is that it doesn't necessarily become a global easing of the pressure, and instead it just becomes shifting the problem elsewhere, and then we actually become unaware of the problem because it gets shit like, like, like it does with global warming, whereby our carbon dioxide emissions get shifted to China, for example, and then we think that we're greener. But yeah. actually, it's, it's our consumption, which is a problem, and I think that just easing the pressure in our country doesn't necessarily solve the problem. Uh, you, you, you mentioned the ocean specifically, that, that's the focus of it. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. No, no, thanks. It's a very good question. Well, um, there are several ways of answering it. The first one, of course, I will, I will take all the ways of answering it because I I'm, uh, talk and talk and talk. But anyway, the, the first one is that um, what you get when you create what's called a no-take zone, a very stupid negative term, but uh, there isn't a, let's call it a blue belt or something, where, where places where commercial fishing can't go, is what ecologists call a spillover effect. That because you've got a place where the, the fish and the crustacea and, and the shellfish can breed without interference and reach very large sizes, which become much more efficient breeders than before, you get a great deal more fish and shellfish being produced, and then that spills over into surrounding waters. And what you find is that um, if you create about 30% no-take zones, the total catch increases several fold, three or four fold, than what it is where we've got the current thing where no area is protected and they can just go in and trash everything. It's, it's insane. So in other words, it's in the interest of the, of the fishing industry, as well as everyone else, that we have large areas where the fishing industry doesn't go. But because we have this incredibly short-term approach, and because of the lobbying power of, 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 of this industry, which is dominated by a few very large super trawlers these days, um, and they see, I don't know what they do, you know, whether they bury the bodies of the people the politicians kill or supply their cocaine or something like this, but they just seem to, seem to completely have them over a barrel somehow, um, that you can't even get something which would be in the interests of the fishing industry, you can't even get that established. But of course, you know, also, I don't want to see this confined to Britain anyway. You know, I see this as part of a global movement. It is part of a global movement. There is a global rewilding movement kicking off now. And it's actually more advanced in some parts of the oceans than it is on land. 
Um, and there's some other countries, you know, China, for instance, you know, is, is much more advanced than we are when it comes to protecting the sea. The Philippines has got very large um, marine reserves where fishing industry can't go, and many other parts of the world as well. We, we're incredibly bad at it. We've got 48,000 square kilometers within our territorial limits. This is the UK's limits, you know, so it's, 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 it's UK jurisdiction, not common fisheries policy. And of those 48,000 square kilometers, five are no take zones. Five square kilometers, that's 0.01% of our total seas. It's just amazing, they're pocket handkerchiefs. I went to the um, one at Flamborough Head, and you could stand on the land and you see, you'd just see these sort of, this little box of boys marking this out. And it reminded me of that bit in Blackadder where, where, where General Melcher says, um, so darling, how much land have we taken today then? So, well, well, um, well, sir, I've laid it out on, on the table here. I've, I've got this um, scale model, sir, the scale model of, of the land, land we've, we've taken. This is like the First World War. And oh, jolly good. And um, what's the scale of that then, then darling? He said, uh, one to one, sir. And he says, come again. Well, it's actually at scale, sir. This is, this is the land we've taken today. And it's like that, you know, because there's this huge sort of fuss about this amazing success. We've got this marine reserve where there's no fishing. And it is so tiny that it's got no ecological function at all. So and there's just three of these. There's that one at Flamborough Head. There's one around Lundy Island, which is literally a few meters around Lundy Island. And then part of Lamlash Bay on the Isle of Arran. And that is it. And all the rest is just totally free for the fishing industry, for the beam trawlers, for the scallop dredgers to just go in and rip it to pieces. Quite amazing. And nowhere is ever given any, any respite from this. That across the entire um, continental shelf of the world, every area of seabed on average is trawled every six months. So there's no possibility of recovery. So it's not surprising that the total fish catch has been going down and down and down because there's nowhere where the fish can breathe. There's nowhere they can escape from this stuff. So it, it, it knits together. Now, when you're on land, you've got a similar situation, um, and not nearly so stark, but potentially a similar situation because the, the productivity in the uplands, um, where, where, where almost exclusively sheep farming is going on, it's so amazingly low, but the damage it does to the hydrology is so amazingly high that it's well within the range of possibility that it's causing a net loss of food production because of the impact it has on much more fertile land, land downstream, which is subject to this cycle of drought and floods. You know, whenever there's a flood, many thousands of hectares of agricultural land are taken out of production, saturated, crops are lost and all the rest of it. Um, when there's a drought, obviously, there's not irrigation water to use. Um, and, and these are profound impacts which it has on, on, on farm production. It makes so much sense for some of those upland areas to be taken out of production for the sake of fertile farming downstream. So, you know, people talk about the sharing versus sparing debate. Do we, do, do we spare land from agriculture or do we try to mix wildlife conservation in with agriculture? Well, in this case, I don't think it applies at all. You need both, but sparing land from agriculture is not going to be reducing food production if that land is a highly infertile land. We're not calling for large-scale rewilding on fertile land because of the impacts it would have on food production, but there's so much land in this country where it has effectively zero impact or even potentially a positive impact on food production. Um, so a woman with a question um, over there. Yeah, you know, I'm going to come to this side in a moment, but um, so I'll, I'll just... Um, I'll, a nice picture that you paint, um, but my concerns at the moment are about hanging on to the tiny little bit that we've wrestled back because the enclosures took the land away from the people, according to my understanding of history. Mm. And the national parks got a tiny bit back for us, and now lots of that is under a huge threat, and nobody seems to be interested. And I think it really brought home to me looking at the whole cracking debate that. You know, lots of us can have these wonderful dreams about what the land should look like, but the ownership of land in this country is concentrated in the hands of so very, very few people. And most of those people, I realise, don't look at the landscape in the way that I do and think, ooh, trees, plants, insects, mm. lovely. They think resources to exploit mm. and slash and burn. And when, when they've done that, 
they don't live with the consequences of it anymore mm. because they just jet around the globe, don't they? Yeah, yeah. So they leave the rest of us with the detritus that they've left yeah. after they exploit everything. So how do we, you know, it, to me, it's the same question over and over again in politics, how do we get from here to there? Mm. How do we get from what we've got now, which I think is the things being degraded and things being wrestled back off us that are ancestors fought really hard for, mm. particularly in this area, like the access to the, the hills and things. How do we hang on to what we've got and how do we take off, take the land back off those people who are just <laughs> use it for themself, their own self-interest yeah, and they don't yeah. care about the rest of us, do they? No, no. Well, well, thanks. I think this is a critical issue. I mean, according to one estimate, Britain has the second highest concentration of land ownership in the world. Now, in Scotland, they're trying to do something about that. You know, in Scotland, things are really beginning to kick off. They've got this land reform commission with a lot of really interesting, quite exciting proposals in there, including like if people are misusing the land, the government can take it off them. Yeah, you know, why not? You know, isn't, isn't that? I mean, this you know, the very idea of being able to own land just seems wrong to me. You know, you can you can have rights to do certain things on land, but why shouldn't landowners lease that land from the community? And then the community would also have the right to be able to say, sorry, we don't want you to use it for, for that. You, you're licensed to use it for these purposes, and you can make money off those purposes if you want, but these purposes are antisocial ones. We're not going to let you do it. You know, what, what, what an extraordinary thing, the very notion that you could own land. And so you have this profoundly undemocratic situation because when the, the land is concentrated, the political economy of that becomes such that you, you, you're basically excluded from the key decision making about you know, how, how our most fundamental asset of all is, 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 is used. Um, and, and you're right to highlight this. It's, it's a really important issue. And for me, land reform and rewilding are two aspects of the same picture. You know, it's a multifaceted picture. You know, there's all sorts of other things which which feed into that. But this, the the notion of of reclaiming land, not only in the countryside but also in the cities, you know, is really important. You know, in the cities, and why do we let the volume house builders build houses? You know, they 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 don't do us any good at all. They parasitize the built environment. You know, these people, um, they sit on their land banks. And they, they, they just speculate on them, they trade in them. And when they finally do deign to build something, they build it in such a way that no one would live there unless they were bloody desperate. But of course, we are bloody desperate because of the way they, they uh, hoard the land bank, so we do have to live there. Where, you know, why not do go, I mean, go even further than what Scotland's proposing? Scotland says, you know, we want, um, we're going to set up this um, housing land corporation and, um, and, and we're going to. Um, uh, basically rest sites back off the, the volume house builders. We're going to design them ourselves and then sell off the plots for people or housing associations or housing co-ops to build their own, which is what so many people want to do. Well, I would go further than that, and this is how it ties in with rewilding and stuff, is to say um, you, you, you get the land back, but then you, you, get, you, you sell options to, to, to build there. Before any building takes place, you sell options and you bring in people on the social housing waiting list as well. And then you get those people to design the whole site. So, so they then decide what, what that entire estate is going to look like, as well as being able to design their individual houses. And you bet your life it's going to be completely different from what Bellway Homes or Wimpy or all these other ones um, are, are providing at the moment. And, and what the, the likely outcome, in my mind, would be, because as soon as people get it, they completely get it, is that you design it around the needs of children. Because if you build, build it around the needs of children, then you build a real community. And, and what that means is like rough play areas. It's basically bits of rewilded land within the estate, because that's what kids really love. That's what they like more than anything. And for me, part of the whole rewilding agenda is to rewild the child. It's to get children outdoors once more, get them engaged with nature on the very small scale, whether it's in sort of the rough bits of the housing estate or, or whether it's on the very large scale, these areas that we're thinking of, 100,000 hectares plus, where you can start getting um, functional ecosystems going again. And it's that re-engagement with nature, getting people back um, in, in, into an understanding and a love for nature, which both create 
creates a new generation of people who are going to fight for it and um, greatly enriches the lives of kids who are now basically battery corn-fed children trapped indoors, which is, is crazy, you know, and they're trapped indoors because there's nowhere for them to go. Right, now, so, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll go to you now, cause I was, um, and then I'll go to someone on this side. So, so there's a man at the front. Sorry to make you do all the running around. And then, then we'll go to that side for a bit after that. So here, here he is, this man here. Uh, just playing devil's advocate a little bit. Um, let's imagine I'm a, a tenant sheep farmer or a gamekeeper mm. or a coppicer or mm. I'm a trollman with one boat that I operate. I'm mm. uh, none of those things, but let's just pretend. Mm. Yep. Um, and you and a well-meaning group come along and say, we want you to stop what you're doing and perhaps what your family's been doing for many generations. We want mm. you to let uh, mm. nature do its thing. It'll be mm. great. Mm. And I'll say, look, mate, I'm trying to earn a living. Yeah. And yeah. you've got this thing called rural poverty. I mean, how do you even start to have that conversation? Sure. Well, I think there are... Wait, thank you for the question, by the way. It's a very pertinent one. I think there are ways of having that conversation. I mean, for a start, you know, we don't want to impose these outcomes. We want to persuade people. We want to bring them round... And, and we want people to want these outcomes because otherwise it's just never going to work. You know, you can't, you can't impose them. You can't force it to happen. Um, and, and, and there are several ways in. First is to say, look, you know, are these traditional industries, are they sustaining communities? Are they sustaining employment? Are they sustaining income? Are they keeping the shops open, the schools open, the chapels open, most importantly, the pubs open? And the answer is, in, in most cases, they're simply not. You know, there's been this, com there's this complete collapse of these rural communities because the traditional livelihoods are not supporting them. And that's with farm subsidies. You know, the, the average hill farm in Wales um, um, uh, takes um, uh, 53,000 pounds in farm subsidies a year and makes 33,000 pounds in total income at the end of the year. So it loses 20 grand a year by chasing sheep over, over rain sodden hills. What's not to like? Yeah, it, it, it's crazy. The economics don't stack up. And for how much longer are we going to have farm subsidies? I mean, look at this situation we've got at the moment. It's just unbelievable. You know, here we are in this time of extreme austerity where basic public services are being cut. The, the, the poor are being hammered and hammered and hammered as essential. The social safety net is being just knifed. It's being slashed to pieces. And, and people are in some cases literally starving because they, they can't get benefit. And yet, the European Union is still paying out 50 billion euros a year on farm subsidies. And it's doing it on a per hectare basis. So the more hectares you have, the more farm subsidies you receive. So there are some people who get millions every year in benefits. Who are getting millions in social security every year um, um, from, 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 from the European Union. That's our money. Now, People just, you know, aren't going to put up with this for much longer. I hope they're not going to put up with this, with this for much longer because it is, a, it is a total scandal. It is a profound social injustice. Um, and, and, and when that happens, well, what are these sheep farmers going to do? You know, what, what, what is their future going to be? Because they sure as hell won't be able to farm sheep anymore. They'll go bankrupt overnight. Because the only thing which is keeping it going is that. And so you say to people, look, this is just... You know, you've got to look to the future here. You've got to find some other way of making a living because the way you're making a living now is not even working with farm subsidies. What's it going to be like without farm subsidies? And then you look at what's happening across Europe and many other parts of the world and even a few places in Britain already that, that people are paying top dollar to go and see exciting wildlife and generating a whole new economy based around bed and breakfasts and you know, all restaurants and all the other stuff which goes with that, which is now sustaining entire areas. You know, there are, there are sheep farmers in Italy now who are encouraging the return of the wolves because they're making more money from the tourists coming to see them than they're making from their sheep. The extraordinary thing is taking place. You know, in many parts of Europe, we're seeing this. And you know, if you want a self-sustaining rural economy, then it's got to be on a different basis. And, and, and rewilding creates the opportunity for, for some of those. And we've seen so many cases around the world where you make a lot more money by wildlife-based activity than you do by farming on infertile land. And yeah, the truth is, harsh as it is, that you've, you, you've got um, a, a situation where with the globalization of food markets, 
if you're on infertile land, you have got no long-term future. That, that you know, it's 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 a tragedy in its own way because you know there are many amazing rural cultures and traditions which are going down the pan, but it appears to be inexorable. You know, there's nothing seems to be able to stop this process, which is why you see this massive amount of land which farmers are just giving up on. You know, right across the eastern United States, vast areas of Europe and other places, the infertile land is now being abandoned by farmers. It's a tragedy. It's also an opportunity to do something better. And 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 there are tremendous there's tremendous scope to do that. Uh, uh, is there a woman in this sector? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. Hello. Um, don't you think it would be beneficial if people <coughs> embraced veganism? Um, I think the earth's devastation is allowed to flourish simply because of the, the demand for fish and meat. Yes, thank you. Well, I mean, there's no question at all that one of the massive impacts and huge pressures on, on the world's natural systems comes from meat production and fish produ you know, and, and fish harvesting. Um, and, and it is unsustainable. I mean, it really is unsustainable. Um, you know, I, I used to sort of labor on the belief, the mistaken belief, that there were some forms of meat production which were kind of okay. And I thought that was like the extensive sheep farming model. Until I started looking into all this and really understanding what had been going on in this country, I'd bought the propaganda as well. But you know, I now see that this, in terms of productivity versus damage, you know, is up there with scallop dredging as about the most damaging thing you can possibly do. And it's, it's, you, know, you can sustain a very tiny amount of meat production without massive environmental impacts, but that's hard to do in a world of 7 billion people, many of whom want to eat meat. Um, so, yeah, you, you're definitely right. Uh, vegetarianism, veganism, um, that, to me, is the only ethical choice. Yeah. Um, so, a man on this side, and then I'll come to the woman here. Um, there, there, there's a man right, uh, right at the back there. Hello, uh, thanks for the inspiring speech. Um, uh, when you talk about rewilding an area, what kind of area are you on about where it would be beneficial? Thank you. Now, it's a highly pertinent question. Well, well, we, we figure that about 100,000 hectares is what you need to have a viable population of wolves or lynx, um, depending on what else is on the land. But, but that's broadly what we're looking at. And so we're in the middle of a big mapping process at the moment to see where the more suitable places might be for, for rewilded areas of that size. And that's sort of political mapping as well as ecological mapping, you know, it's sort of looking at um, where the opportunities lie uh, as well as where the ecology is right. The obvious first starting point is the Cairngorms, the west, western side of the Cairngorms National Park. You've already got over 100,000 hectares there in more or less sympathetic management. It's sort of heading towards the rewilding model. They're all kind of waking up to the idea that this is the way forward. Um, next week I'm going to a meeting of large landowners a little further to the west again from there to see if I can persuade some of them to join their land to that and make you know really potentially very big contiguous blocks or 300, 400,000 hectares which would, you know, that would be truly exciting you know then, then you're talking about an awful lot of potential. But we want to try and do the same in, 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 in in parts of England and parts of Wales as well and you know, we just have to be able to find people we can work with change the political climate so that people accept it people people understand that this is a this is our future this is a way forward it's a more positive vision than we have at the moment um, and and then to try to create linkages between them and what you know we you know while we want those big core areas we don't want them to be completely remote from people's lives and so we want to make connections both for the sake of wildlife so that it can move between those areas so it becomes more genetically viable there's more mixing um, but also for the sake of people so that you can have sort of more, more more contact with it and 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 in my view the 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 way to do it is to look at the rivers because of course the rivers they come from the uplands they come from the in areas we're interested in and they come through the cities and the towns there's hardly any cities or towns in britain which are not built around rivers and and to have buffer zones along those rivers, like sort of 50 meters either side of them, 
uh, gives a whole lot of really positive effects. First of all, um, that that um, 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 the, the the ecological systems beside rivers are much richer in wildlife than those anywhere else because um, a lot of wildlife uses that liminal zone between between the woods and the water uh, as its habitat. Um, secondly, you, you've got the um, um, the fact that it, it prevents the leaching of farm chemicals into the water supply. If you've got a buffer zone, it absorbs all that. It prevents soil erosion and it slows down floods. It provides the, what they call the, the hydraulic roughness, which slows down the water when you get floods and makes it less likely that you get these catastrophic events in, in, in places where people live. Um, and, and then you've got that connectivity, which allows certain species beavers and otters, for example, which most people seem to love, um, then come sort of deep into the cities. Um, and so people can have that, that, that connection with nature, and nature can have the connection with a much wider area, uh, wider area of land than it would otherwise have. So, so for me, it's the rivers which stitch it all together. Right, um, so uh, you next at the front. And then after that, we'll take about five more questions. Hi, yeah, I was just wondering um, if there are any specific rewilding projects around South Yorkshire or the surrounding area um, that someone like me can get involved in with no land of my own or uh, background in ecology. Thank you. Um, there's one or two very small initiatives at the moment, um, but we're, 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 one of the things we'll be doing is publishing a directory of all the places where, where there's initiatives going on. And you know, I think we're going to see a lot more beginning to spring up. I mean, already there's a big buzz about this in, in many parts of the country. People are saying, well, we want to do this too. And, um, and so there will be local rewilding groups setting up just about everywhere. And there's bound to be at least one in Yorkshire setting up. Um, so, so, so yeah, watch this space. Keep, keep looking at, you know, if you sign up to our, our, our web feed um, um, through, through, through the, the holding site we've got at the moment, as soon as things start to happen, you'll be able to find out about them. Thank you. Right, so um, this man here had his hand up for, for a while. Keep, keep your hand up and get the microphone. Yeah, there he is. Can, oh, so, oh, oh, so, sorry, sir, are you having to do a lot of running around? Hi there, yeah. Um, my background's in forestry. I've um, across a lot of people who really, really don't like grey squirrel. Um, <laughs> Oh, I actually got a colleague who wants to hit a tree because he was trying to hit the grey squirrel in his stem. <laughs> um, do you know of any legal reason why pine marting reintroduction doesn't take place in England? Well, I, 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 the, the immediate answer is that it looks like it is going to start taking place pretty quickly. There's a group now called the Vincent Wildlife Trust who, who are concentrating on trying to get pine martins back and they're part of our network, part of the people who we, we're hoping to support through re, re, rewilding Britain. Um, and, and yeah, so suddenly people are waking up to the potential here, especially foresters. I went to speak to Forest Enterprise the other day to their annual meeting, and they got very excited about pine martins and about lynx for that matter, because lynx is a specialist roe deer predator, also takes seeker deer, this exotic deer, um, which in Scotland is, is playing havoc with young woodlands. Um, and hides in the plantation so, so they can't be shot, but the lynx gets in there and, and, and takes them out. So the foresters, yeah, they're, they're getting pretty sympathetic to some of these ideas. Um, I, I mean, what, what, you know, what, what we want to do in all of these cases is not to rush. I mean, you know, we're very excited about it, but we, we don't want to be too impatient. And so with things like bringing back pine martins to areas, we, you know, do a proper ecological assessment first, make sure that there's nothing hyper vulnerable which has been reduced to tiny levels which could be affected by them and the rest of it but then you know assuming there's no real killer obstacle then just get them back as, as, as soon as possible after that and and i think we're going to see a lot of pine martin reintroduction taking place pretty quickly across this country especially now we've seen the results from ireland and, um, is there a woman in this block at all there's, there's, there's one at the back yes keep your hand up in fact there's there's two so Maybe, maybe you can both have a go. Um, yeah. Otherwise, otherwise you'd have to fight it out. Yeah. So, so yes, yeah, so that, that's right. Lady, right at the very back, and then one, two, two rows in, in front. So. Um, 
Um, what sort of reaction has the idea of rewilding received from organizations like DEFRA and uh, Natural England and yeah. um, the National Trust, those kinds of organizations? Thank you very much, yes. And would you like to ask yours, and then I'll try to answer them both at the same time. I'd love to see walls and links is back in the country, but I know when they've been um, introduced back into America, there's been quite a lot of problems with them being rooted. Mm. And I wonder how you would go about protecting those species so that we would bring them back to be persecuted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, two very pertinent questions there. So, yes, on, on what's the sort of official and the semi official reaction been? Well, if we start with the National Trust, um, I, I went to see them before Feral was published before my, my book about rewilding was published and, and pretty well got the cold shoulder. They, they, they were quite hostile to what I was saying. But then the book came out, things started, the buzz began to build up a bit and they got a new director general. And the old one was a real dinosaur. The new one has, has seen things in a different light and suddenly they've become extremely supportive and, and they're part of our network now and they're already talking about large-scale rewilding of some of their land and things are really looking good with the National Trust, it's exciting. Natural England is lions led by donkeys. Um, the, there's, there's some great people on the ground who would really like to see some sweeping changes take place. Um, you know, scarcely a week goes by when I'm not talking to Natural England people, but um, they've got this appalling board, it's, it's unbelievable. It's run by by this um, t major Tory donor who, whose wealth came from his house building company, the Volume House Builder. Uh, it's, it's, its deputy chairman is um, um, the head of the Environment Bank, which is the prime, the, the, the Britain's leading biodiversity offsetting company. So Natural England decides to go ahead with biodiversity offsets and who benefits? It's, it's unbelievable. And then it's got two, not one, but two Wahhabi Cumbrian sheep farmers on the board who are just like, and I know both of them, and they both are, are totally inimical to, to any wildlife at all. They just hate wildlife. And, and it's got bankers. I mean, it's, like, it's, it's absolutely insane. So, so it's, it's a country under enemy occupation at the moment, um, natural England. And, um, and any, any positive initiative just gets crushed. So that's going to take a while. As for DEFRA, doing everything farmers' representatives ask, that's what it stands for. Um, it's, 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 just, it's just a write-off at the moment. You know, you've got, there's DEFRA, 17 Smith Square um, in London. There's the National Farmers Union, 16 Smith Square. You know, it might as well be the same organisation. It's, it's really amazing. The National Farmers Union speaks and, and DEFRA is ventriloquising it. You know, it's because the National Farmers Union, like a ventriloquist dummy, has got its hand up. Oh, never mind. But, yeah, it's, but, 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 but you know, that, that's the story. So it's, re it's really an uphill battle. And even when there's a change of government, it doesn't make any difference you know, because the civil servants are still in place and they only listen to, to what the National Farmers Union and the Country Landowners Association are saying. It's, it's shocking. But you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get them. We'll, we'll get there in the end, but it's going to take a while. Um, yeah, protection of wolves and lynx. I mean, it's a very pertinent issue. And basically, that's one of the reasons why you've got to have the public with you, why you can't impose these things. You know, if we just said, right, we're going up to Scotland, we're going to release a load of wolves now, they'd all be shot. You know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to protect them. But so first of all, you've got to build up the, the public awareness and the public um, desire for, for these species. And then it'll become politically impossible to get rid of them. And, and, and that's, that's our hope, that you, know, you make it, you, you get people inspired by the idea, um, you build up a public consensus that it's a good thing to have. And then when the landowners do start shooting them, and they will shoot a few, they become extremely unpopular and they get prosecuted. And, you know, we're seeing this with the, with the raptors, they're killing the hen harriers, the eagles, the peregrines and all the rest of it, which are you know, killed on a vast scale by these wretched grouse moors. Um, and, and, you know, until recently, they just got away with it. But, well, well, they still do to an extent. I mean, it, it's, it's appalling the, the, the low extent to which they're prosecuted, but it's beginning to build up. You know, it's getting better. It's heading in the right direction because of the public outrage about what they're doing. Now, that public outrage has taken a long time to build, but it's, it's there now. But, you know, it's, it's, it's even more... So it's easier to mobilize even, I think, with things like wolves and lynx because they are actually very popular species. People really love them and they're such 
fascinating, amazing intelligent species that the idea of just shooting them um, is just seemed to be anathema by many people. Right, you're all getting really hot, so am I. So I'm just going to take two more questions. So there's a man there. Keep your hand up. Sorry about those I won't be able to get to. Okay, uh, reading the single lines, I get the impression you don't really like sheep. <laughs> you know, okay. well, look, I mean, it, cattle are an indigenous species to Britain, or rather the, the wild aurochs, which is the ancestor of the cattle, um, is an indigenous species, though it no longer exists. So the cow is the nearest thing. And, and I wouldn't in any way want to say there should be no herbivores. You know, we do need grazers. But what they call conservation grazing, in many cases, bears no relationship to what you find in nature because you've got these enclosed animals given supplementary feeding in the winter at far greater concentrations than you'd ever find. I mean, you know, the aurochs was a migratory animal. It was a largely forest creature. You could tell the difference um, during the Mesolithic between aurochs and domestic cattle bones um, by the isotopes. And what you saw from the aurochs bones is that they were browsing on woodland plants while the cattle were, were, were in the fields which had been created, um, uh, sorry, in the Neolithic, I mean, uh, in the fields that had been created by farmers, and, and they were eating grass. Um, and, but, you know, the way we're keeping cattle on, on conservation sites is very similar to the way cattle are kept on, on any other farms. And, and that, again, is, is holding down nature. It's preventing the trees from growing. It's preventing these structurally complex habitats from forming. Um, and, and it just makes it very um, um, hard for, for any, any nature to be restored. And I've been to see some of the conservation grazing very close to here. And uh, I just, you know, and the question I was asking at the RSPB when I went to see their, their work was, why? Why are you doing this? You know, I could see the, the, I could totally see the argument. Once you've got some trees back, of having a very few cattle which are moved off very quickly. You have them in and then they move out, just like the aurochs used to do. You know, they'd migrate very long distances. They wouldn't stay very long in any one place. Um, I could totally see the argument for having a bit of that. Having them staying in one place for months on end at high densities, that to me doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, you've had your hand up for a long time, so I will come to you. Uh, Thank for your uh, <laughs> inspiring presentation, but also allowing me to ask the question. Um, <laughs> I wonder if you could just say a little bit about your thinking on the relationship between rewilding and public health policy. Wow, uh, right. Um, well, yes, I, I do think there is a relationship. I mean, there's a relationship between everything, but, uh, but in, in this case, I mean... Getting people outdoors, obviously, is great for public health. That's, that's very well established. And, and the more people are outdoors and the more exercise they take in the outdoors, obviously, we know that. But also, you know, the, the mental health aspect of having these places where you really can leave it all behind, that, that has got to be highly valuable. Now, you know, I, I'm, I'm wary of these very instrumentalist arguments which say, you know, we can save the NHS X billion pounds if, if we have more, more, have more nature. And, you know, the whole natural capital agenda, which says, you know, these ecosystem services are valued at this. Therefore, there's an economic argument for, 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 for looking after the natural world. Yeah, you know, I can see that under some circumstances that can be useful, but it also devalues the natural world. It says, you know, we're sort of forcing it into the economy. The moment you put a price on it, it ceases. It, it loses its inherent value, um, and and it makes us forget why it is that we love nature. Um, but you know, in terms of, of of our general well-being, and undoubtedly there's there's overlap here with public health. Having places in which we can get away from it all and have remarkable, uplifting, enchanting experiences. Well, for me, that's a big part of what rewilding is all about. And, and I suppose, well, there were several things which encouraged me to go down this route and, and, and become very excited about this idea. But one of them was something that happened to me when I was kayaking um, in Cardigan Bay. I took my sea kayak out on a very lumpy sea. It was a characteristically stupid thing to do. In fact, it was the daftest thing I'd done for, well, a whole week. Um, and, uh, you know, it was like a 10-foot swell, and it was really quite nasty, very lumpy water, very choppy. 
And, um, and I'd been out miles um, because that's what I love doing, just getting away as far as possible and finding this sort of place of, it feels like a place of safety, but it's often a very dangerous place, but you know, miles offshore. And I was coming back and saw that the tide had risen, the, the wind had risen, the waves had risen, and they were just smacking into the seawall. It was great. It was, it was terrifying. And you could see, I was sitting there about 200 meters offshore, watching these dirty waves coming in, and, and you could hear the scatter of gravel against the seawall like grape shot. And there was just nowhere I could see where I could get in. And while I was looking and looking and looking to see if there was a gap in the wave somewhere I could exploit, suddenly there was this horrendous noise behind me. Um, and it sounded like a great wave breaking. And, and so I, I assumed that several waves had come together, and it occasionally happens, into this real monster breaker. And so I ducked down, but nothing happened. And I thought, well, this is just bizarre. And I looked around, you know, there was no great wave. And then I saw the explanation, this great grey hooked fin came up immediately under the shaft of my paddle. It just came, it just rose out of the water and very nearly touched the shaft of my paddle and then went down again. And I knew what it was, but there was this sort of thrill of fear, even though I knew this wasn't frightening, I wasn't actually under attack, it felt almost as if I were. And then I heard the noise again, this great rushing explosion of water, and I turned. And this bull dolphin, the same length as my kayak, 13 feet long, came soaring right over my head. And as he went down the other side, he looked back. And for that split <laughs> second, we made eye contact. And, and it was, I just forgot everything else. And for weeks, I was like walking on air after that. It was the most amazing transformative experience. And I thought, whatever that drug is, I want to take that again and again and again because it's the best thing I've ever tried. And it was then that I realized we should be able to have, we should have a situation where we can have that again and again, where you can interact with magnificent wildlife, where you can go to a place and expect to see something really, really special. And maybe even occasionally to have a really, really special encounter like that, because they change your life. They certainly changed my life. And they made me, that made me even more determined to fight for that ecosystem, for the fight for those dolphins, but also to have a lot more of it. You know, there should be dolphins all around our coast. There should be whales all around our coast. I want, before I'm too old to do it, to be kayaking with whales off the coast of Britain. And why not? Is that too much to ask? And who wouldn't want to do that? Who, I mean, what an amazing, fantastic thing to be able to do. That's the kind of experience I want to become available to us for public health reasons, but for mental health reasons, for all sorts of reasons, but part, uh, above anything else because of the possibility in this hurried and stressful and difficult world of losing ourselves and succumbing to ecstasy and enchantment. To me, that is a core of rewilding. Thank you.